This first part, I will uh, especially focus on the theoretical and fundamental physical or chemical aspects uh, of uh, our polarizable embedding method, which is uh, based on fluctuating charges. And then uh, I will leave the stage to Franco that will show you how to run this kind of calculations. Uh, why are we specifically interested in developing uh, uh, methods uh, for accounting uh, for the external environment. This is an example. Here is a die. This is a so-called Reichers die. And then uh, these are, you know, what you get uh, experimentally. So if you dissolve this kind of die in different solvents or different polarity and uh, hydrogen bonding uh, uh, capability, you get uh, this picture. So depending on the solvent, uh, you see a completely different color. This is a challenge for computational spectroscopy because in general what you do at uh, the first instance if you want to uh, compute a spectral signal is that uh, you completely uh, neglect uh, the presence of the solvent or the environment. And in this particular case what you will get uh, is that you will end up uh, probably in one of this kind of colors but for sure you cannot reproduce this kind uh, of behavior. And then this is one of the challenges that we have for our method, uh, which is uh, uh, specifically suited for solvents, uh, but can be applied also to a generic environment, uh, pending uh, that you have uh, parametrization, as you will see. So when uh, you want to uh, compute some kind of spectral signal for, uh, let's say, solvated systems, uh, you basically have two ways. The one on the right uh, is the most common and that that you probably have already used, uh, that is to resort to continuum models such as PCRM or COSMO. In this case, what you get uh, is some kind of mean field effect uh, that completely discards any kind of uh, atomic detail in the solvent. Uh, and this means that for sure you cannot get, for instance, any representation of specific solvent interaction such as uh, hydrogen bonding. Completely different way is to resort to discrete models when you keep uh, the atomistic uh, picture of your solvent. And then uh, what you do in general is not to treat uh, all the system at the same level, let's say the QM level, because for computational spectroscopy we need quantum mechanics and quantum chemistry, but you can probably divide your um, system in two parts. A part that is the solute, and then uh, it is uh, uh, treated at the quantum mechanical level, and the other one that is the solvent that is classically treated. And in fact, this is what we do. And then uh, this is the basics of our method, which is a focused method. This means that we focus the attention to a specific portion of the system, and you select this kind of a portion based on the chemical intuition and on the nature of the process that you want to model. And then uh, you focus the attention, and you treat it very accur accurately with the QM method that you like. And then the remaining portion uh, is treated instead uh, at the classical level by means of some kind of suitable uh, force field. Then the problem of calculating uh, this, uh, the, the property of the solvated system is then shifted uh, to the definition of the interaction between the QM and the MM portion. Such kind of interaction uh, from the physical point of view, is divided in two parts, the electrostatic term and the non-electrostatic one. I will focus on the electrostatic term and specifically in the case that you want to account for the polarization of the QM part, which is due to the MM part and vice versa. In our method that is named QMFQ, QM fluctuating charges, uh, we use the general uh, partition of the energy that is common to any kind of QM-MM method. 
And uh, uh, we have two coupling uh, uh, hypotheses between the QM and the MM part. Uh, and the first one is that the electrostatic energy of the MM layer is defined, well defined, so can be defined formally. And it is especially variational with respect to the corresponding density of charge. And then we see an interaction at the classical level, so we don't have exchange effects. As for the MM portion, you know that in general, you, when you define a general force field, this is the sum of different uh, contributions. And by uh, focusing especially on the electrostatic portion, then you need to choose what kind of force field you want to use. And especially if you want to use a non-polarizable force field, which means that you have a bunch of fixed charges placed on the MEM atoms, or if you want to allow some kind of polarization, and then use instead the polarizable force field. This way, the charges, for instance, that you place on the MM atoms, can adjust to the molecular density, which is treated at the QM level. Our basic force field, we have basically two force fields. This is the first one, is the fluctuating charges that is rooted in the electronegativity equalization principle. And then you assume that at the equilibrium, the instantaneous electronegativity of any atom has the same value. Then you can write an expansion for your energy of the classical portion in terms of charges and some kind of interaction kernel. In our first implementation, we use the Arnold kernel, but, uh, which is here written, but we can also use other kind of uh, interaction kernels. Then, uh, if you uh, resort to the EEP, then you end up with uh, uh, some kind of functional for the energy of the MM portion, which depends on the electronegativities, chemical hardnesses, and charges. So the Qs here are the charges that are not fixed, but are fluctuating, so they uh, change. We are particularly interested in coupling this kind of force field with the QM Hamiltonian. And then what you need at that point, you use the Hamiltonian that you like. We generally use the DFT Hamiltonian, but you, know, you can potentially couple this kind of method to any kind of Hamiltonian. And then the problem switches to define the interaction term. And in case of the FQ, you have a term which depends on uh, the potential of the QM system, which depends on the density matrix of the system, and the fluctuating charges which are placed on the MM atoms. Once you have that, then you have defined your uh, uh, Hamiltonian, your, your effective Hamiltonian. We, you can put charges on MM atoms, but you can also put dipoles. And uh, you can end up with having a method that is based on fluctuating charges and fluctuating dipoles. This is, you know, the, the force field is pretty similar. And then you have, uh, in that case, uh, terms that depend on the charges and also on the dipoles. The final equation for the energy of the MM portion is this one. You see that you have contributions depending on charges, dipoles, and interaction between the charges and the dipoles. This is a way of refining uh, the electrostatic uh, uh, energy that uh, you assign uh, to your uh, classical portion. In order to compute uh, and uh, the charges and the dipoles, uh, you know, the same equation also applies if you don't have the dipoles, so simply you don't have the blocks of the matrix and in the vectors that depends on the, uh, on the dipoles, then you end up with some kind of this kind of uh, uh, equation here, which is a matrix equation, and then you solve it. Then finally, you define your charges and dipoles. If you want to uh, 
couple with a QM Hamiltonian, you do exactly in the same way as FQ when you have an interaction term that depends on uh, uh, charges and dipoles, and then you end up with uh, you know a system of equations where you also have uh, the QM potential and the field. Uh, FQ and FQF mu exactly similar to any kind of uh, molecular mechanics force fields need to be parametrized. And in fact, uh, this is what we do. Here is uh, uh, the parametrization that we have for FQF mu. And then uh, what we decided to do is, uh, for instance, for water, you can parametrize whatever kind of solvent or environment you want. And this is, in fact, something that I will uh, show you. Here is uh, the parameterization that we have for water. And then we have parameterized against the uh, uh, Kitaura Molokuma electros, uh, um, electric, electrostatic energy uh, uh, approximation. And here as are the results. Uh, this is, for instance, in case of uh, water, what is the contribution of charges and dipoles and the total electrostatic energy. And uh, uh, the parameterization that we have is pretty accurate. So this is a comparison between the curve that you can get uh, by computing uh, uh, water dimer, by computing uh, one water molecule at the QM level and the other one at the FQF mu uh, up level. Uh, with respect to what we get with uh, uh, accurate methods, very accurate ones, such as couple caster, or uh, uh, very accurate methods for calculating the reaction energies, which is the SAPT method. Okay, so this is exactly you know what we do, and then we do it for the solvent. For instance, in this case, this is water. And then uh, you can compute any kind of system in water, but not only the energy, but also the properties, as I will show you. The quality of the electrostatic energy depends uh, on uh, the method that you are using. Here, uh, focus, let's focus on the green and blue uh, points. You see the green ones is QMFQ with the same uh, Hamiltonian, and the blue ones is QM FQF mu. You see that uh, you know FQF mu refines uh, uh, in some cases substantially what you you get uh, with uh, uh, simply by simply using uh, fluctuating charges. I started by saying that we develop methods for spectroscopy, and indeed this is what we do. So we are not specifically intent, interested in energies, but especially in properties. First property might be geometry optimization, and in fact we have a way to compute uh, uh, gradients and to optimize the geometry of any kind of solute in the solvent by using uh, FQ or FQF mu. We have uh, response equations, and in this way, you might uh, compute uh, absorption and emission spectra, for instance. You see that, uh, you know, basically what we need to do is to rework all the equations and all the methods that are in the code in order to uh, complement uh, the methods that we are already implemented and coded uh, with our uh, specificities. Today, uh, to date, uh, the implementation that we have allows you to compute excitation energy, so UVVs, absorption or transmission spectra and polarizabilities, and uh, very soon uh, you will also be able to compute with our methods NMR, optical rotation, Raman and infrared spectra, and Raman optical activity. What is important to understand is that uh, uh, computing quantity with the QMFQ needs uh, a complex computational protocol that is divided basically in steps. First step uh, is to get uh, a physically consistent representation of your system. You have a solute and a bunch, uh, you know, few uh, um, thousand of molecules of, of solvent around it, and then uh, you need to sample. 
this kind of system. You cannot uh, uh, calculate and compute a single configuration because in this case what you get uh, is the property that is specific for the solute uh, with the solvent arranged in a specific uh, uh, way around it so in fixed at fixed positions around the solute so the first step that you need to do is to get some kind of sampling of your system what we, in general we do and what we recommend also is to run first the molecular dynamic simulation by using uh, the force feed that you like. In that way, you can analyze your molecular dynamics and especially you can extract a bunch, bunch of representative snapshots, uh, which are the basis of your calculation. So, in that in case of our method in order to get a final spectrum you will need to run the calculation for your property let's say excitation energy for instance for all the snapshots that you extract for the molecular dynamics until you get the convergence of your signal hmm? so you extract the snapshots you compute the, the property for each snapshot then you average and finally you get your spectral signal. If you want to get more information, you can, for instance, uh, look at this uh, recent review that is published in Chemical Society Reviews that is especially about the protocol and what you can compute with our method. But in general, at the end of this uh, protocol, you end up with uh, this uh, picture that I have on top. So. For each snapshot, this is an infrared spectrum, you get a series of sticks. But you are not interested in the one single stick or a you know, bunch of sticks, but on the average. And then if you average, you get what I have here at the bottom of the slide, which is actually the spectrum. You see immediately, and this is, a, for instance, a molecule in aqueous solution, and this is a comparison between computations and experiment, that uh, uh, the broadening uh, uh, is uh, uh, automatically included in the calculation. So you don't need to broaden your uh, lines, your sticks, because this is something that uh, uh, you have automatically at the end of a calculation. And in general, uh, this is a slide uh, is especially representative of the quality of the results that you can get uh, between uh, compute calculations and experiments. You see that you not only you have a good representation of the general, uh, you know, the peaks, the position and the uh, intensities of the peaks, but also of the general shape of the spectrum. So uh, QMFQ and then FMU uh, were intended at first uh, to describe uh, uh, strongly uh, interacting solid solvent systems and especially the case of water interacting with the solutes where you can get hydrogen bonding interaction. But this is not actually a limitation. And in fact, you can use our method for any kind of solvent because the formulation is absolutely general. So there is nothing in the theory that tells you that this is only intended for water. This is generally intended for environment, whatever kind of environment you have. We have uh, recently parameterized uh, the method, in this case FQ, uh, for different solvents. And uh, by using uh, a method that is used uh, generally for parameterizing uh, force field, and then we have applied to model uh, four dyes in different solvents. The solvent that we have are dioxin, tetrahydrofuran, acetonitrile, ethanol, methanol, and water. And you see on the, at the bottom of this slide, what is the performance? This is, you know, on the left, you have continuum PCM model. You see that it is pretty scattered with respect to the experiment. So in general, PCM is pretty good for medium polarity solvents, 
or also polar solvents that lack uh, specific interaction uh, capability. In case of water and the specific uh, hydrogen bonding solvents, then you cannot think that you can get good results. And in fact, this is the case. Then we have the electrostatic embedding in the middle. This means that you don't allow the solvent to polarize to the solute and, the, and vice versa, that, but you only have a zero order uh, interaction. And then on the right, you have QMFQ. And then you see that you know the interaction is such that uh, your experiment uh, is modeled uh, uh, in a much better way. So we are not limited to water. And this is the main uh, you know, message of this slide. We may also compute large systems because we have coupled our method, for instance, with the FTB, which is one of the uh, methods that you have in our code. And also in this case, similar to whatever kind of Hamiltonian, uh, you need to couple, and then we have done it for all the different approximations that we have for the FTB. What you need is to add some contributions in the Hamiltonian. So you have the, contr the contribution from the beginning, and then the contribution of the solvent and the embedding uh, you know, propagates to properties uh, in a uh, you know, natural way. This is again the FTB, and this is, for instance, an example. This is ubiquitin, which is a protein, more than 1,000 atoms in aqueous solutions. And this is a calculation of uh, uh, an absorption spectrum in water. And this is especially the difference between gas phase and water. So by using this method, uh, you can also go and compute uh, very large systems. So this is not, you know, something that it is the limitation of the method. I mean, that depends on uh, how big uh, is your cluster. We might also, uh, and we have uh, um, coupled FQ with an intermediate layer treated at QM level, not full QM, but with the frozen density embedding which is another of the features that are in our code. And uh, again, you need to work out the equations from the beginning. This is the energy of a QM FDE FQ system. You see that you have the QM plus the uh, FDE uh, contribution, and then you have FQ part that depends on the Q charges. We have linear response so that you can compute uh, absorption energies and then spectra for this kind of uh, method. In this way, you have in somehow a way of refining uh, the first shell of solvation by allowing uh, uh, quantum treatment, for instance, of repulsion and dispersion in the, in the first shell that you have. And these are some uh, representative uh, uh, examples, uh, two dyes, a crawling and uh, uh, this other one. Mm. And you see that, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, the spectra, the comparison between the experiment, uh, again, uh, in uh, orange, uh, continuum solvent or FQ or intermediate layer. And for acrolane, what is important is that acrolane has two um, states. So the spectrum is dominated by two transitions with different nature. And depending uh, uh, on the solvent, uh, you have uh, a solvatochromic shift that goes in the different direction. So and pi star goes in minus direction, pi pi in the plus direction. And this is the performance and you are of your method. And then you see that uh, by using QM, FD, E, FQ, you get uh, final values for solvatochromic shifts that are pretty well in agreement with the experiments. Okay, that's basically all what I wanted to tell you. I want to acknowledge uh, my group here in Pisa and especially funding agency. Um, some of the work that I have shown you is funded by the European Research Council by means of a personal grant that I have uh, uh, got uh, uh, a few years ago. And then here is a brief, uh, but you know, 
video of uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy, which is uh, the city of the Leaning Tower. So probably all of you know the place. So if you happen to come to Pisa, uh, tell us and visit us. Okay, so I am done. So you see the tower here, okay? Pretty near to our, <laughs> where I am now. Okay, so I can probably stop here, leave the stage to Franco. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, Franco, you can just go ahead and continue. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Thomas, for introduction, and thank you, Chiara, for the, your first part of the talk. Now, in my uh, uh, my part of the talk, what I would like to do is to show you how to actually perform these calculations using UMS. Um, as Chiara said, the, the calculation is quite complicated because there are a few steps uh, involved. But I'm going to show you that performing all of these steps is actually quite easy using AMS. So this is not something that you should uh, be afraid about, uh, of doing. I'm just going to start from the AMS job uh, window of the graphical user interface and go ahead and create a new input file. So let's say I want to calculate something simple. So an absorption spectrum uh, for a, a simple organic molecule. So first I would have to create my molecule in this case, uh, because it is uh, what a simple molecule, uh, such as methyloxirane, I can use the search tool to just summon a pre-optimized uh, molecule. If you want a different one, you may have to optimize its geometry, but we are not going to go through that step uh, in this case, because it has been pre-optimized. Um, so now I have my molecule in my input uh, in my input window, and what I want to do is to set up the calculation. Uh, so, as Chiara said, there are always two steps to any QMFQ calculations. Uh, first, you have to perform a sampling using molecular dynamics, and then you do the uh, quantum mechanical calculation. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to set up the molecular dynamics first. Now, first, what we want to do is, of course, um, create a, a box and uh, fill, it, fill it up with uh, water molecules. So I'm going to go on Edit Builder to create my box, uh, which I can, I'm going to select uh, a box with a 30 angstrom radius, and I'm going to fill it with waters. So I'm going to fill the box with uh, 897 waters. So in, if the box were empty, you would have about 900 mo water molecules. Of course, it's 30 by uh, 30. By 30. Uh, but these three missing molecules are just to account for the volume occupied by the solute. I'm going to select water here. And you can see that this selection is reasonable uh, as shown in the uh, density that is written at the bottom, which is uh, about the density that you would expect from a water solution. So I'm going to generate the water molecules and the program automatically uh, sets up the water molecules at random orientations. I'm going to close the builder and set up the uh, molecular dynamics calculation. So I change the engine to the force field engine and set up a, a molecular dynamics, uh, dynamics task. Of course, I need to select uh, a force field. I'm going to use GAF in this case and enable automatic atom typing. Now, for every molecular dynamics uh, simulation, I need to do uh, to select a thermostat and barostat. But I first need to worry about the fact that because the water molecules uh, have been placed in random positions and they uh, they, they are in complete uh, they have a completely out of equilibrium uh, uh, configuration. So first, I always need to do uh, um, an equilibration equilibration step. So first of all, I'm going to set up my MD. I'm going to choose uh, 100,000 steps with a time step of 0.5 femtoseconds and a temperature of uh, ambient temperature of 300 Kelvin. For the thermostat and barostat, uh, I'm going to uh, make some very basic selection. I'm going to use the Berentzen barostat with one atmosphere, so ambient uh, uh, pressure 
and I'm going to select the lumping constant and an equalized uh, uh, barostat in all three directions because I don't want my box to become re rectangular. I just want it to remain a cube. I'm also going to select the thermostat for this calculation, uh, just a basic Berenson and uh, thermostat with ambient temperature uh, and uh, an appropriate damping constant. Now for these uh, type of calculations, molecular dynamics calculations, all of these setups may appear uh, uh, a bit difficult to understand because you have to select many different things uh, unless you are an expert in molecular dynamics simulations. But in fact, we had a very uh, thorough and complete um, uh, seminar in this series uh, a few weeks ago by uh, Tomasz Strinka, who went over all of these steps and explained why we might want to select a certain value for the time step or not. So I invite you, if you have any uh, uh, doubts, I invite you to go and watch that on our YouTube channel. And that's it. That's all we needed to do. If I go on to file and run, I can run this calculation just to equilibrate my system. Of course, I'm not going to actually do that now because it takes some time. So I have already run all of these simulation steps and I'm going to show you the result. So I'm going to close up this window and this is the equilibration uh, calculation that I ran before. If I right click uh, and open AMS movie, you can see uh, the results of this equilibration calculation. The energy starts out really high and rapidly drops to uh, the equilibrium value, of course, at the beginning, because of the random orientation and uh, random velocities of the water molecules, the energy was supposed to be high. And we can also check uh, how well our thermostat and barostat did by adding a graph and going to properties and, for example, temperature. Again, you can see the temperature at the beginning was uh, over 700 Kelvin and then went down very rapidly to the equilibrium temperature that I had selected and remained pretty stable around 300 Kelvin. So once you've run your equilibration, you can right click input to create a new input and the program uh, offers you the possibility to start from the end of it. So you with, with everything equilibrated with a new job. So I'm gonna just gonna click yes. And everything has been uh, loaded up in the calculation panel as well. So you have all the pre-selected uh, options uh, for the force field and, and everything else. For uh, This is now uh, ready to run uh, as a production calculation to actually sample the configuration space of this system. For this, however, it is recommended to, do, to, to use a different thermostat. I'm going to use an NHC thermostat, which is better for production calculations. Again, this is something that uh, Tomasz has talked about in his own seminar. And that's the only thing that I really needed to change. Uh, at this point, I, I could just go file, run, and run this uh, molecular dynamics simulation. As you see, uh, as you've seen, even this very complicated step of molecular dynamics doesn't take very long and is actually pretty simple. Uh, again, I have uh, run this uh, simulation already. I have it over here. And again, if I right, right click movie, I can actually see the results of this calculation. This is the energy. As you can see, it oscillates around the average uh, pretty consistently. I can also, again, add uh, more uh, graphs. Uh, for example, the pressure. I can see the pressure stays, uh, again, around uh, the pressure that I had pre-selected, uh, so around the equilibrium. Uh, and at this point, what I can do is actually also change uh, the, the input, uh, the, 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 configura the configuration that I am looking at by navigating the molecular dynamics. And I can also uh, select whichever one I want and save the coordinates in a file by uh, uh, choosing uh, File, Save Geometry. After I have saved uh, my geometry file, I can then use it to perform the QMFQ calculation. So for example, uh, to do that, I can just open a new input, a clean input, and load the, the coordinates. So for example, here I have the XYZ file that I have uh, pre-saved. And you can see this is just one of the snapshots that I have extract extracted. Now, what you want to do with this, these snapshots is always to um, uh, cut a sphere around the solute because you want your, uh, your solvent to uh, have a, a completely isotropic effect on your solute. 
Now the solid is a bit difficult to see because it is hidden behind the solvent molecules. So what I can do is uh, select molecule uh, and select uh, atoms, all the uh, oxygen and hydrogen atoms, and then change the uh, visualization uh, style. And you can see now the carbon skeleton of the solute, solute is very visible. So how do you cut a sphere around this solute? Now I can see that the solute is very close to the uh, border of the box. So one thing to do is if I were to cut a sphere like this, then there will be empty spots. I don't want that. So I'm going to uh, replicate this box using periodic boundary conditions um, in order to fill up that space. So I'm going to edit crystal and generate supercell. I'm going to generate a three by three by three supercell <clears throat> in order to have a complete uh, uh, region around the solute. Here it is. It's a bit difficult to see, but uh, I can easily go navigate and select any one of the atoms of the solute uh, at the very center. I can then select the whole molecule. And now it is going to be much easier to cut a, a sphere around it. This is uh, very easy with the GUI. Uh, you just select uh, within radius. And I have just have to choose a radius around the solute that I want to include. Uh, in our experience, usually 12 to 16 angstrom is more than enough. Electrostatic interactions are long range, but this, uh, this type of range is more than enough. So I'm just going to select uh, 12 angstrom. And you can see in blue, some uh, atoms have been selected. And I'm also going to complete all bonds by choosing select molecule because some of the uh, bonds uh, in the water molecules may have been cut. So I'm going to complete those. And then I want to delete the excess. Deleting the excess is very easy. I just invert the selection in order to select all of uh, the uh, molecules around uh, my selection and delete the atoms. And there we go. Now we have a very clean uh, droplet, as we call it, um, with the solute at the center uh, and the solvent around it. It is a good practice to recenter this uh, uh, system with a, a, a Cartesian axis centered on the solute. So I'm going to select one atom and set origin and also re, uh, readjust all the coordinates around that atom. So uh, with using the map to atoms uh, tool. And now I have my system. I should also uh, tell you that I, I, if I'm going too fast that you can find all of this information uh, in the tutorial that we have in our website. So don't fret uh, about this. So now I have, that I have a system, uh, it will be very easy to set up an actual quantum mechanical calculation with the FQ model. All I have to do is change the engine from band to ADF. And I can just select whichever quantum mechanical model that I want. Uh, for the task, the single point task is most more than enough. If I want to calculate a spectrum, all I have to do is uh, select uh, a function, such as the PBE function, relativity level, uh, basis set, uh, and uh, a frozen core option. Everything else can be set up as any other type of quantum mechanical calculation. Say if I'm if I'm interested in uh, the absorption spectrum for this molecule, then I have to go to properties and select excitations. Now, if I want a spectrum, I'm only interested in singlet excitations because any other type of excitation will be uh, spin forbidden, so it will not be visible. And I just select how many excitations I want. Uh, say I want to calculate the first four excitations for this system. Now, if I were to run the calculation right now, the program would treat the entire system quantum mechanically, which is not what we want to do. It makes no sense to uh, treat all water molecules quantum mechanically because the calculation would be very expensive. And also I get a level of details that I'm not interested in. And this is where the FQ model comes in. Now, in order to use the FQ model, I need to divide my system into uh, two regions. So first I select the whole solute molecule, and then uh, I go to model regions in order to create my two regions. I first add the uh, region pertaining to the solute uh, by clicking this plus sign, and then I can rename it to solute, for example. 
I can then invert the selection to select the water molecules instead and add the second uh, layer, which I can call solvent. Now we have defined the two regions. Uh, I can then go into model and select QMFQ and enable the QMFQ model. As Chiara said, there are two different types of models at two different levels of theory. Uh, you have FQ or FQ, F mu in case you want to add dipole. I'm going to stick with FQ right now. I can also just select the, the charge that I want to place on each uh, FQ molecule because these are just waters and just leave it at zero. And also I, now I have to assign the two regions to the two uh, levels of theory. So for the solute, I'm going to treat it as quantum mechanically and the solvent, I can assign it to the FQ part. You can see that the program automatically uh, detected that I am doing water. Uh, and so it pre-selected the parameters for the FQ uh, calculation for me. Of course, if you're doing any other uh, type of uh, solvent or environment, you may have to adjust the parameters yourself, or even if you want to change parameters for water, you can also adjust them easily by uh, modifying the numbers in these boxes. And that's all there is. This is already ready to be run. I, if I go to file run, uh, this is going to run the, the spectrum calculation for this snapshot. I can close, close this up um, because I have already uh, run a few of these calculations. For example, this is the snapshot number 500. If I right click spectra, I can show you the result. So this is the absorption spectrum for this one uh, um, snapshot. At the top, at the bottom left, I have the different uh, excitations separated. Uh, and if I click on any one of them, I can see the orbitals involved in this transition uh, <clears throat> written on the right. And if I click on any one of them, it, it automatically shows them to me. So this is, makes it very easy to assign the type of transition that I have. Now, as uh, Chiara pointed out uh, earlier, this is not a spectrum that is representative of the system. This is just one of the uh, snapshots. So you have your solute with a, just a single configuration of solvent molecules around it. You might wonder how different uh, it, it is going to be just by changing the arrangement of the water molecules around. I'm going to show you two uh, snapshots uh, in comparison. I'm just using two rather than 100 because it makes it much easier to visualize. So. Uh, I have computed, computed here the snapshot number 100 and 500, and the AMS jobs uh, tool uh, makes it very easy to combine their uh, spectra. If I go to tools uh, and select add to SDF, I can create a new file with a pooled, uh, uh, with the pooled results from the two files. Um, I can call, for example, average.sdf. I have done this already, I have it right here. And if I right click uh, spectra, there we have a combined spectrum. However, you need to be careful because by default, this tool will uh, weight the spectra according to their Boltzmann uh, weight. This is not what we want to do. So we want to go down here in this menu and select uniform. You can see uh, the uh, spectrum has changed quite a bit. The reason for this is that the snapshots have already been implicitly weighted by the molecular dynamics. So if you had a certain configuration which has a lower energy and therefore a higher Boltzmann population, then you will find more snapshots with that particular configuration. So if you were to weigh it again, you would be double counting the uh, Boltzmann weight for these snapshots. So you just want a simple average of the spectra which is what you can do by selecting uniform over here. So this is the, just the average of the two spectra. Here you can see at the bottom left uh, all the single transitions. And you can also view the two spectra separately if you don't just don't want to view the average. And look at that. These are just two separate snapshots. Now you have to remember this, the molecule we selected, methyloxyrene, is quite rigid. So this huge difference between these two spectra that I'm observing is not really due to um, a geometry change in uh, the solute, or rather not just that, but it's uh, the reason we, the spectra are very different because the solvent around the, or around the solute is very different. And that is why you need a large number of uh, uh, snapshots. 
Now for absorption, you don't need that many. Uh, in our experience, 100 is usually enough. Uh, but for some other properties like optical rotation, for example, you may need a few thousand. So that's why you need to run sometimes long molecular dynamics uh, simulations in order to have many uh, different uncorrelated snapshots to extract and then calculate. Now, luckily, uh, you, you may think this uh, adds a lot of computational uh, complexity to the problem. But in fact, even if you have a lot of solvent molecules around your solute, because uh, this model is a QM MM model, the cost, uh, the additional cost due to the solvent is very low. So if you can perform a quantum mechanical calculation on a certain solute, then most certainly you can perform the same calculation with, the, with many hundreds of solvent molecules around it using this model. Now, I have only showed you a very simple absorption uh, spectrum calculation. However, you should keep in mind that you can do all sorts of things. As Chiara said, very soon we are going, you're going to be able to calculate uh, vibrational spectra, so like infrared or Raman. You can do more complex frozen density bending calculations with uh, a multi-layer model using QM, FTE, or FQ. This is all possible with the graphical user interface, and you can find tutorials for this in our website. And uh, you, soon you will also be able to use the DFTB engine instead of ADF, which will allow you to calculate much larger systems. And I guess, so this concludes my presentation. I hope everything is clear. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Yeah, thank you to the two of you. Thank you very much. This was uh, yeah quite insightful and uh, lots of impressive results as well. Um, yeah, so there's one question um, from the audience uh, regarding your choice of relativity, but I think that we can answer directly. So uh, why did you set relativity to none? Um, I think you're mistaken here when you say that the 3D molecule needs relativity. Um, the relativity is usually needed uh, or switched on when it matters, which is typically the case for heavier atoms or some special electronic situations. So. Uh, that is basically if you if you look into a textbook or so. I think also in our manual we have some some instructions on when to switch that on and when it is more efficient to to leave that away because it's simply a choice of uh, efficiency. Um, exactly. Yeah. Choosing scalar doesn't really add a lot of computational power, so that's also a perfectly fine option. But because my molecule only had uh, second period atoms, so exactly. many light atoms. Uh, yeah. The difference is very small. So for anyway. some transition metal complexes or so, you may want to switch that on. Otherwise, it's a little bit faster to leave it out. Um, so maybe one question um, regarding the the GUI. And um, so I understand that these spectra, if they come from a sufficiently large set of ND snapshots, you should see some um, sort of natural broadening effect, right? So uh, maybe that is to add here that the GUI tends to apply broadening automatically to the spectra. So you would need to switch that off. Uh, That's right. You, you can select, uh, you, usually rather than switching it off, what you can do is uh, lower a lot the, the broadening because you don't want just to have, you don't, don't just want a stick spectrum. Yeah. You want a little bit of broadening, mm -hmm. but so very just narrow to make peaks it yeah. smoother, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, something else from my own experience. So when you build this droplet model, um, what you want to do if you have much larger systems, because the GUI usually then becomes slow. Um, so when I had to do this for some very large model, uh, usually you want to set the uh, solute in the center and then apply the periodic boundary conditions to uh, minus a half and to a half basically and then then you can make the sphere without uh, creating a supercell which will bring your computer down if there are tens of thousands of atoms in there from my own experience yeah that's a possibility but i should also mention what one thing i didn't say is that all of this uh, I, of, of course i've shown the GUI, but all of this is also uh, scriptable of using slot our uh, scripting language using Python. So all of these steps can be very easily automatized if you know a little bit of Python scripting. And that makes uh, especially this step of cutting a sphere around your molecule very mm -hmm. easy. Even for thousands of snapshots, it becomes instantaneous. Yeah, so then um, I also have a lot of uh, questions noted down for, for Kara and for your part. Um, so maybe the first one, just something general. Um, 
So of course, between excitations, uh, there are some which involve like significant charge transfer and some some dipole during the transition, while others are more localized or so. Are there any guidelines on, on when to use uh, what type of, of the embedding model then? Okay, yes, thanks for, if I understand uh, your questions, you're, you mean if you have charge transfer mm -hmm. with, between the solute and the solvent? Uh, no, so regarding different so charge transfer or more localized excitations within... Ah, okay, the, fine. So the, this is, but this is uh, yeah, I see. The, this, is, uh, uh, this depends on the molecule, and then what is important in that case is to use a QM method that is able to uh, model this kind of uh, excitations, but, you know, the solvent is put exactly in the same way, mm -hmm. okay? For sure, you know, the quality of the, 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 the molecular dynamics is an issue, and then, uh, but what I generally recommend uh, is that you need that you, we have uh, uh, different ways of running molecular dynamics. In principle, this is also, can be also done by uh, using a sampling uh, a initial molecular dynamics or QMM molecular dynamics, if you want. And uh, it, in a, according to our experience, this is not necessary mm -hmm. because it is, is a way of sampling. So you, we use molecular dynamics for sampling and in most cases, this is, uh, you know, something that is not needed, but in principle you can. And, uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, once you have that, uh, then you set up your Hamiltonian that you want. Uh, and then for sure, in case of charge transfer excitations, it is better to use a specific kind of uh, DFT um, functional, uh -huh. uh, but that's all. And then the solvent goes automatically in the same way. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Um... Yeah, the next thing I noted down. So basically, you have um, gradients available for this for this model. So uh, would it, in principle, be possible also instead of using a linear response calculation to do some explicit time evolution of the system and, and uh, model electronic excitations that way? Or basically, if they say couple with some uh, nuclear motions or something to that extent? Uh -huh. Yes, it is. In principle, you can. Uh, it is a matter of developing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, method. someone needs to sit down and but implement it, it. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, something else, but uh, again, similar in a similar category. Uh, also, because I some years ago written a tutorial on this. Um, this is looks very similar to. Um, these dim QM models and all the variations we had in uh, we had for years in, in the Amsterdam modeling suit. Um, so what uh, what this tutorial I was referring to was about is basically uh, embedding a organic molecule in between two large uh, metallic nanoparticles and then uh, basically creating uh, plasmon excitations or some plasmon. Uh, resonance with the excitations of that molecule and um, which, which in that case was used for some uh, nonlinear optical properties. But would that be applicable as well then for some something which is not an explicit solvent but rather something more metallic or so? Uh, yes, indeed uh, this is what we are doing uh, and this is what is actually funded explicitly by the European Research Council. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, um, you know, developing uh, the method that we call Omega FQ, mm -hmm. which is FQ uh, frequency dependent, uh -huh. uh, and it is uh, specifically intended to model uh, plasmonic response of metals uh, and graphene, for instance. Mm -hmm. And this is also something that will appear at some point uh, in the in the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking looking forward to that definitely. Um, Likewise, so that's probably a more straightforward thing. So then um, that probably also would work for molecular crystals, right? So as, as Franco probably still remembers, we have been struggling for a while with uh, modeling OLED materials. And so now there's some code out of that as well. But I think that is also a very straightforward application for this once, once the implementation is in place, right? And yeah, what is important is that, uh, you know, you have uh, a sensible representation of the physics of the system. Mm -hmm. 
And then, uh, depending on that, then you develop the embedding method that is able to catch the physics. So FQ uh, is some kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, is specifically use, used for solvents uh, because it's isotropic uh -huh. uh, method. Then if you have non-isotropic, uh, uh, you have uh, the sampling that for sure if you have in that case uh, the crystal structure is not isotropic by definition uh -huh. but also uh, you can put the dipoles and then you have uh, uh, more ionisotropicity in your uh, uh, embedding response uh -huh. okay so yeah and this is exactly you know what actually we do and the, the, the topic of our research is to develop, uh, you know, put the physics of the system inside a computational method for embedding. Mm -hmm. And um, is there something which, uh, so if you have dipoles, uh, would that be applicable also in a periodic calculation then? As in uh, Frank right, you know, not, not, in, not in the current uh, um, implementation as mm -hmm. far as I understand. But this is something that, you know, in principle, we can do. We need to develop uh, and to extend the method. Mm -hmm. So, but from the method itself, there is, there is no assumption which, which would prevent this or so and from having periodic dipoles or something. And Yeah, we need to work out the questions mm -hmm. from the beginning, yeah. as usual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah, but this, uh, indeed. So... But this is our job. Yeah. This is exactly our job. So we know how to do uh -huh. it. And, uh, yeah, just as a last thing. So uh, this basically is a way of, of uh, also then getting more complex spectroscopical properties without having the need to, let's say, shift or uh, scale different parts of the uh, spectrum. So the results you have shown, uh, which, which were so nicely aligning with the experiments then, they are without any of that, right? So Yes, no scaling. Mm -hmm. But the scaling basically depends on the QM level that you are using. Mm -hmm. Okay, that for sure, you know, the solvent generally goes in the right direction with respect to some kind of reference calculation at the same, at the same level in the gas phase. Mm -hmm. So you compute the property in the gas phase, then you know where you are, mm -hmm. more or less, and then you see the shift of your property resulting from the from the solvent. So if you want to scale, you might scale the gas phase result instead of scaling the solvent. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that, uh, so that's at least the questions I had from my side. Um, yeah, if there are any from the audience still, um, otherwise, uh, I would then also conclude this session. Um, so this was also the last uh, session we had scheduled for this uh, series of webinar events. Uh, so I hope these have been fruitful for everyone attending. And um, yeah, maybe also some some call for, for some feedback. Uh, so it would be very uh, helpful for us if uh, you could as low know your general opinion on this format, um, if it has been helpful for you, and maybe also some suggestions on um, yeah, how to proceed, if this makes sense to, to set up uh, after the summer break in a uh, yeah, renewed series, or second part of this series, season two, if you will. Um, so any kind of feedback on, on uh, the pre this and the previous talks uh, is highly appreciated. Yeah, with that, uh, Chiara and Franco, thank you very much once again. Uh, very impressive talk, very nice to see these results and also how they translate them into uh, our modeling suit. And yeah, with that, I would like to wish everyone a pleasant rest of the day.